Welcome everyone to this first episode of a new series I'd like to call Simple, Simple to Complex, complex to where complex. I want to explore in three levels of complexity a certain aspect of game development. Now I've been a programmer for really a long time and every time I discover something new or I get a new idea or work on the different systems that I've never worked on before and I discover new stuff it gives me an endorphin rush and I really enjoy this feeling of discovery so I want to try to share with all of you some of the discoveries I've made throughout the year and this week I want to look at game economy and I want to help people wrap their head around the fact that sometimes you can make a great game with a very small team of independent developers and sometimes you need a studio of several hundred people and a couple of years to make a good game even though both games are really fun why some games need so much people and why some games can be made with a very tiny studio <laughs> Now the first level of complexity would be the beginner and I'm not talking about someone who's never used a computer who doesn't know how to make video games or something. You have to think about what it is to implement a game economy inside a game. It's kind of like learning a new musical instrument. I mean, even if you've never played a guitar, you can pick it up, you can pluck the strings, you can make sounds, and if you watch a couple of tutorials online then you can probably make some kind of music. Well, a game economy is something similar. Even if you don't have much experience as a programmer or anything, you can watch a few tutorials and, you know, you can look at the game and you can already kind of tell what kind of systems you'll have to implement. For example, in an RPG system, you'll have the experience point and maybe some kind of gold coin. And you can use the experience point to unlock a skill or something like that and the gold coin to purchase new items and weapons and upgrade your equipment. Now, the first step, the beginner step, is actually implementing those systems. And it's not necessarily easy. I mean, implementing a whole merchant system and dropping coins and, and inventory management and all of this, it's related to a lot of other systems in the game and it can be quite a big task in itself. But the first level is really just getting the basics down. Now for me, the second level is where things get interesting. And if you've ever done the first level, then you probably have an idea of what the second level is gonna be. What I mean is that after you've implemented the basic systems, you'll want to try to connect those systems together so that they make something coherent in your game. That can mean stuff like tracking the player progression and making sure that his level match the power of the enemies he's going to encounter. But it also means making sure that he can't buy a weapon that's totally overpowered and completely breaks the balance of the game or all these kind of things that you have to juggle once you've got a couple of different economy systems implemented. Now I think that's the level where a lot of indie game really shine. You know, it's taking those little systems, one or two systems at most, and just polishing them and making them just absolutely amazing. For example, if you take a game like Stardew Valley, well, there is the whole concept of managing the economy of your farm and, you know, making crops to sell them to people to get gold so you can upgrade your buildings and then there's also a separate system, if you will, it's kind of like an economy of relationship management where people kind of have favor towards you and you have to give them gifts and manage their anniversaries and stuff like that so that they come to like you and you can start a relationship with them. Well, these systems are really, really simple, but they're quite unique and original and they're very well balanced so that the game itself becomes very enjoyable. So level one is about creating the systems and level two is about connecting them and balancing them. Now level three is a little bit special and that's where you start needing a studio if you want to pull it off. Because there comes a point in any kind of crafts where you are not learning new tricks or applying new concepts or something, you're just really polishing your skills to a really high level so that you can pile systems on top of each other and then connect them together in a kind of really intricate web that will become kind of its own thing with very unique and complex interaction. 
In a way, we could visualize those systems as independent nodes in a graph, and when they interact with each other, we can draw a connection between those nodes. Now, in a game like Stardew Valleys, for example, the, the trading of crops and the relationship systems are kind of separate systems, and they interact with each other through the trading of items. So you could say that the trading of item is a different system. So you have the farming, the item trading, and the relationship, and these are connected together like so. But this is a pretty simple graph. If you take something like WoW or EVE Online, where the economy is front and center, you'll see that there's dozens of different economic systems and that they all kind of interact with each other, creating basically something called a fully connected graph. And if you know a little bit about graph theory, you know that the number of links between a fully connecting graph is related to the number of nodes in your graph, which is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. And if you were to plot the number of connection to the number of nodes in your graph, you'll see that this is basically an exponent. An exponential function means that it grows much more quickly every time you add a new node. But these connections between your different systems, they're not something that happened magically when you design your system. They're something you have to design, program, and balance carefully for each new system you add to your game. And that means that if you have something like 17 systems and you want to add an 18th one, then you have 17 connections to that system that you need to carefully tweak and balance and design. And that's going to take a lot of your time. Now, to illustrate my point, let's look at different examples of each of those levels. Now, it's purely from a game economy perspective, so that means that maybe this game has a lot of very complex systems, but from an economy standpoint, it might be very simple. One of these examples is the game Celeste, which is a very amazing game and an amazing platformer, but as far as economy goes, I couldn't find much interesting economy. There's the collection of strawberries that can give you a score bonus and maybe unlock a few achievements, and there's a few other collectibles in the game that you can pick up for unlocking some content, but that's pretty much it, and it's pretty much isolated in its own bubble, it doesn't serve any purpose, it doesn't give you any advantage in the game, it doesn't level up your character or anything like that. So these systems are very easy to implement and there really isn't much balancing that needs to be done. So this is probably a good example of uh, one level or the level one I'm talking about. Another good example of this basic level one type of economy is often found in roguelike like uh, Binding of Isaac or Enter the Gungeon or the Rogue Legacy game, where uh, there's not many uh, economic systems per se, and often they're very simple. For example, in Rogue Legacy, you collect coins that you can use then to upgrade your castle, which unlocks new ability, but that's pretty much it. And there isn't that much balancing or connecting systems to interact with each other. Then at level 2, like I mentioned before, there's a game like Stardew Valley, which has the economic aspect of it really at the center, after all you're managing a farm, but it has really, really well thought out and really well designed economic systems, from the trading to the relationship management. There's a lot of subtleties and intricacies in each of those systems. The number of crops you can grow and their time and the seasons and the uh, likes and dislikes of each of the characters and the gifts you can give them on their anniversaries to the missions that you can complete for certain characters to increase your uh, rating with them, if you will. There's a lot of stuff going on, and these are also connected to non-economic systems like the combat, or the farming, or the fishing, and all of this makes it a really complex game with very basic systems. And then we have the level 3, and I can't really explain in detail any of the systems in a AAA game because it's just so complicated, it would take several videos just to break down a single game. But we can have a quick overview of the mother of all economic games, I'm talking about EVE Online, also known as the Spreadsheet Simulator. Now in 2016 or so, I was playing EVE Online for nearly a year, and I only scratched the surface of everything that goes on inside EVE Online. 
that CCP released every month a very interesting report of the economic state of the game. And the most interesting part for me of this report is the list of all faucets and sink in the game, which is basically the way the wealth is generated and lost so that the game economy can be balanced. And if you consider that each of the item on this list is a different economic system, you can already see just how many systems there are in this game. But not only that, you can see how some of these systems are already connected together. For example, the bounty payout is usually served after killing a player or an NPC that had a bounty on him. But that means that this player that lost his ship will probably have an insurance payout, which is connected to the insurance system. And then, of course, some of these missions are given by NPC, so there will be an NPC mission reward connected to this, which connects to the uh, NPC mission systems. And all of these are all connected together to the other systems, like the manufacturing, the craftings, the ships, the player skills, and all of these other systems that the game has. And remember, balancing and implementing each of those interactions is actually, in my opinion, harder than just implementing the basic systems itself. So that means that all of those lines are a different economic system in EVE Online, and all of those lines need to be balanced, created, every time a new system needs to be added. And the idea for me to add, for example, a new system in EVE Online and make sure that it's balanced with everything else in the game and that you don't have one of those systems be much more uh, valuable or can make much more money than all the other systems in the game just boggles my mind. That said, my conclusion of all this is that once you have a little bit of experience, you should be very easily able to list all the systems you're planning to implement in your game. And with just a tiny little bit more experience, you'll probably be able to draw a connection between each of those systems. And it's a very nice way of estimating how much work something is gonna be, because if you have Five connection, it might be doable as a single developer. If you have 500 connection, then you'll probably need a studio and a big team of developers to be able to pull it off. And that also can help you judge the complexity or avoid scope creep in your project if you can keep these lines and these connections between each system somewhat in check. Now, in the future, I'd like to do a similar episode on other types of systems you can find in the game, whether it's the animation systems or the physics or the character controls or the camera systems, I'd really like to break these down into their three levels. But for now, that's gonna be it for this week and I hope you enjoyed. Leave a like and see you all in my next episode. Bye!